Good afternoon, students. Today is Monday, 3 May 2021, the long anticipated final lecture for the semester. <clears throat> now, let me remind you after today, there will be no more videos. This will be the final video. <clears throat> the only thing remaining for you to do is go onto Canvas and take the third exam. And that third exam will be available from 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening on the 11th of May. And that's only eight days from now. So please make sure you go in at some point during that day, take the exam, which gives you 75 minutes, and <clears throat> you then should wait for your grade. Now, I'm not going to email grades. I have a deadline. I have to go into MyMav and post the grades. I have no idea what happens after that, honestly. I've been teaching at UTA for 32 years. I do my duty. I get my grades posted. I have no control over what happens after that. I have no knowledge of what happens after that. It's up to the university to make grades available to students. Okay, once again, go in and take the exam on the 11th of May, which is eight days from today, and your <clears throat> grades will be available when the university makes them available to you in whatever way the university makes them available. Okay, today should be a short lecture. We're wrapping up our discussion of Ross, David Ross. <clears throat> why is the why do I call this theory Rossian pluralism? For the simple reason that for Ross there is a plurality of duties. Not just one duty, such as Kant would suggest, but a plurality of duties. And specifically Ross says that there are seven prima facie duties. He gives them names. We've covered four of the seven, and we have three more to do today. The four that we have covered in order are fidelity, reparation, gratitude, and justice. Today we're going to begin with beneficence, then we're going to turn to what's called self-improvement, and then the final duty is non-maleficence. Now, you, re you may recall that I posted earlier in the course a handout on beneficence. So you need to go back to Canvas, find that handout, make sure you've printed it and studied it, because there may be questions drawn directly from that handout. So beneficence is a topic we've already discussed in the course, but I want to tell you a little bit about Ross's view of it. First of all, beneficence is a forward-looking duty. The other four duties that we've discussed so far are backward looking. Fidelity looked backward. It saw that a promise or other commitment had been made and then says that you have a duty because of that. Reparation looks backward. If you have wronged somebody in the past, you now have a duty to repair it or rectify it. The third prima facie duty is gratitude. If someone has benefited you or, or shown a kindness to you in the past, you now have a duty of gratitude, a debt of gratitude that must be paid. Fourth is justice. Justice has to do with giving people what they deserve or giving people what they are due. And that has to do with their behavior. People who, who do well, who act rightly, deserve reward. They deserve to be happy. People who who act wrongly, people who fail to do their duty, people who harm others uh, in an unjustified way deserve punishment. They deserve to be unhappy. And so the virtue known as, the duty known as justice consists in giving people what they deserve. Good people deserve reward, bad des people deserve punishment. Beneficence is forward-looking. It it asks you, it tells you, you have a duty to do good for others. You have a duty to benefit other people. Not to, not to feel a certain motive or feeling that may or may not exist, but to do something. Remember, beneficence is the doing of good. Benevolence is the disposition or inclination or motive to do good. So the duty is not to feel benevolent or to be motivated in a certain way, probably you can't voluntarily control those things anyway. 
But one thing you can control is your actions. And the duty of beneficence is a duty to do something, not a duty to feel something or to have a certain motive. So what exactly does the duty, the prima facie duty of beneficence involve, according to Ross? Let's begin with this. Ross believes that there are three intrinsically good things. Actually, four, sorry. According to Ross, each of the following four items is intrinsically good. And what that means is these are things that are good in and of themselves. They're not good just because they lead to something else that's good. That would be extrinsic value or instrumental value. Intrinsic value means these are things that are good for their own sake, in and of themselves. Um, the first item on Ross's list is virtue. And by virtue, he means something like good character. On page 17 of his book, published in 1930, you can see that he identifies virtue with goodness of character. So you have a duty to do what you can to promote good character in others. Promote other people's virtue. Now, that may be difficult to do, but that's something you have a duty to do. Number two, the second intrinsically valuable thing, according to Ross, is pleasure. Notice, Bentham and Mill, the great utilitarians, believe that pleasure is the only intrinsically good thing. Ross agrees with them that pleasure is intrinsically good. He disagrees with them that it's the only intrinsic good. So for Ross, who's a pluralist about the good, as well as a pluralist about duty, Ross believes that pleasure is one of four intrinsic goods, things that are good in and of themselves. And so when we put this together with beneficence, Ross is saying that you have a duty to bring about pleasure for others, right? Be a pleasure spreader, right? Go out into the world on a regular basis and make people happy. Um, bring, bring them or cause them to have pleasant experiences. And that obviously rules out pain, right? The duty to bring about pleasure obviously precludes the bringing about of pain or suffering. The third intrinsic good, according to Ross, is he calls it the allocation of pleasure to the virtuous. And what he's talking about is justice. Justice is intrinsically good. A state of affairs in which people get what they deserve is a good, intrinsically good state of affairs. So notice something interesting. When criminals, when evil people get punished, that's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because it's, it's a state of affairs in which people are getting what they deserve. So notice Bentham and Mill said that punishment is a necessary evil. Punishment is an evil, but sometimes in their view, it's necessary in order to deter other people from committing crimes. Ross has a different view of punishment. Ross says that when punishment is inflicted on those who deserve it, it's a good thing. It's inherently good. It's intrinsically good that people get what they deserve. So good people getting, uh, being happy and bad people being unhappy is a good state of affairs, according to Ross. And the fourth and final intrinsic good for Ross is knowledge. Knowledge, which is the state of knowing. Uh, now, I have to caution you on something. I don't know how it happened, but Ross repeatedly uses the word intelligence when he pretty clearly means knowledge. In fact, you can look at his book, and uh, I can give you page references. On page 24 of his book, he makes it clear that by the word intelligence, he means knowledge. And of course, knowledge and intelligence are not the same. But for some reason, Ross equated them in his book. So from now on, I'm going to correct Ross. And whenever, I, whenever he says intelligence, I'm going to replace that word with knowledge. It's knowledge that is intrinsically good, according to Ross. It's better to know how things are than not to know them. In fact, it's inherently good or intrinsically good to know the truth, even if the truth is painful 
or even if the truth is harmful in some way, right? Simply knowing the truth about the world is a good state of affairs, a good thing, okay? So you can think of knowledge as, and this, these are Ross's words from page 17 of his original edition of his book. Knowledge, he says, is, quote, intelligent understanding of the world, unquote. So it's understanding. Knowledge is understanding how things are. And he put that word intelligent in there, intelligent understanding. And that's probably why he slipped up occasionally and he used the word intelligence when he meant knowledge. Okay, so for Ross, there are four things that are intrinsically good. A, be a beneficent person is someone who brings about each of those four goods. So you and I, according to Ross, every one of us has a duty, a prima facie duty, to make the world a more pleasant place, to increase the sum of knowledge. Uh, we have a duty to improve other people's moral character, which means making them virtuous. And we have a duty to do justice. We have a duty to see to it that pleasure and pain are allocated to it, proportionately to people's merit or desert, okay? So the allocation of pleasure to the virtuous, that's one of Ross's uh, intrinsic goods. And we have a duty to bring it about. Okay, notice something interesting that Ross doesn't mention. If we have a duty to promote pleasure, and if animals can feel pleasure, which they pretty clearly can, then we have a duty to, you would think, we have a duty to promote the pleasure of animals, not just human beings. So that would be an implication of Ross's view, one that he doesn't discuss, but it looks like it, it follows from his, uh, his moral theory. So animals do matter, but only because they can experience pleasure and pain. Now let me give some examples of uh, the four different aspects of beneficence. Do you remember our discussion of justice? I said justice has five aspects. Don't act unjustly. And remember, I gave examples of each of these involving the person, the student in the library who has money stolen. Don't act unjustly. Prevent injustice. Remove injustice. Reduce the amount of injustice. And affirmatively act justly, act in a just way. So justice has five different aspects. Beneficence has four different aspects. Let me run through them and give you examples. Number one, you do good for others when you prevent harm to them. So the idea is that somebody is in a certain situation, that person is threatened with some harm, and you can do something to prevent that harm from occurring. Right? You can save the person. You can stave off harm in some way, prevent harm. Example, knocking the, knocking the gun out of an assassin's hand. If you come across someone who looks as though he or she is going to kill someone, you can prevent it by knocking the gun out of the assassin's hand. Okay, so that would be a way to prevent harm to others. You can, what if you throw a life preserver to someone who's drowning? If the person grabs onto it and gets to shore, uh, you have prevented a grave harm to the person who might otherwise have drowned. Third, vaccinating people. That's a topic in the news now very much. If you administer a vaccination that may prevent someone from getting a certain disease. It may save that person's life or prevent that person from getting terribly sick. So vaccinations are a way to do good, by specifically by preventing harm. Um, notice that the harm that's threatened could be by another human or it could be from a natural event, right? So, if someone is about to be harmed by another person, I can intervene and stop it. So I may have prevented harm by stopping the, the would-be uh, killer or assassin or batterer. But the harm may also be threatened from a natural event. 
uh, suppose a tree is falling, about to fall on somebody, and I push you out of the way uh, so that the tree doesn't strike you. I have prevented harm to you and therefore done good for you. So it may sound strange, but one way, not the only way, but one way to do good for others is to prevent harm from befalling them or, or uh, ca being caused to them. Okay? One way of doing good is to prevent harm to other people. Uh, okay, um, secondly, I said there were four aspects. That's the first one. The second one is removing harm. Now, the idea here is that harm has already occurred. Maybe you, come, maybe you come upon an accident scene, and the accident has already occurred, and someone is suffering terribly and may die. If you take steps, if you spring into action and, and take steps to save the person's life by applying a tourniquet, or calling medical um, authorities, uh, or if you have medical training, you may be able to do something. Uh, maybe the, the person has swallowed his or her tongue, and you can pull the tongue back to promote breathing. Uh, maybe someone has, or what about in a restaurant, someone's choking. I, the, the harm is already, has already occurred. Maybe you can remove it by uh, using the Heimlich maneuver and, and expelling whatever is causing the obstruction. So that would be a way to remove harm. Uh, the story of the Good Samaritan in the Bible would illustrate this. How does that story go now? Someone comes upon um, a robbery victim on the side of a road, it's a stranger, and the person not only tends to the wounds of the, of the victim of the robbery, but also takes that person to a, a nearby inn and also pays, promises to pay a sum of money to the innkeeper uh, for whatever the lodging costs and, and says, I'll be back to pay the cost of the lodging. I'm good for the money. So that's someone who removed harm. That person may well have died on the side of the road had you not come along and rendered assistance. So that's called removing harm. The fourth aspect of doing good is reducing the amount of harm or alleviating the harm in some way. So what if someone, what if you come upon an accident and someone's been severely injured and, and is in terrible agony, maybe with broken bones, uh, the person will eventually get medical treatment, but in the meantime, if you can do something to alleviate the pain, you will not be removing the harm because you're not setting the broken bones or anything, but maybe you can relieve the, the harm by decreasing the amount of pain that's being experienced. Maybe you happen to have an Advil or some other uh, pain relief drug on you. You can give it to the accident victim and that will reduce the total amount of harm. Now, ideally, if you could get rid of all the harm, you would, but maybe you can't. And if you can't, then reducing the amount of harm is certainly better than doing nothing. And finally, there's what I call the, the pure conferral of a benefit. Um, it, sometimes just promoting people's pleasure or making people happy is a way to fulfill your prima facie duty of beneficence. It's not as though anybody's been harmed or is even in danger of being harmed. But you can go about, as you live your life, and do things that make people happy or bring pleasure to them. So here's an example of that. Suppose my neighbors have, uh, my, my, neighbors, my neighbor's family is adequately fed and housed and clothed. They have adequate education and medical care, but nothing beyond that. The parents are doing their duty, but little or no more than their duty. Suppose you have ample resources, you have lots of money, you could do something nice for those kids to make them happy, right? You could, you could pay for a swing set to be put in the yard of your neighbor, or you, you could offer to do so. Uh, you could buy those children bicycles so that they had some bikes to ride that would make them very happy. It would be good for them as well, good exercise. Uh, so you can do things simply to promote pleasure or bring pleasure into people's lives. Notice, I'm assuming those children are not in danger of being harmed. They're getting all their needs satisfied. 
and they haven't already been harmed, so you're not bringing them back up to a, you know, a, the condition before they were harmed. You're simply promoting pleasure to them. So here's how I like to illustrate these four aspects. Imagine a baseline. Let this be the baseline for somebody, and, and anything above the baseline is a good, a good thing for that person, right? More happiness, better off, more pleasure. Anything below the baseline makes the condition worse. Pain, suffering, injury, and so on. Distress. Okay, so let me use this baseline metaphor to illustrate all four aspects of beneficence. The duty, to, the duty of beneficence says, first of all, prevent harm. And that means if someone's at the baseline right here, do what you can to keep that person from falling below it. So if the tree is about to fall and strike, that's obviously going to put the person way down here. If you can prevent that person from being struck by the tree, you're keeping the person at the baseline. And that's a doing a good thing for that person, isn't it? Okay, what about removing harm? This time, the person has already experienced harm. So the person has fallen from the baseline down here. If you can get that person back up to the baseline, you would be removing the harm. And that's a good thing as well. All right, number three. What if the person has fallen this far down below the baseline? The person has already been harmed. If you can get the person up here a little bit closer to the baseline, that's a good thing. You'll be doing good. Maybe you can't get the person all the way back, but moving from here to here is certainly a good thing for the person. And finally, the fourth aspect is what I call a conferring a benefit, a pure benefit. The person is here, like those children, and you're doing something to move them above their baseline, to make them happier. Okay, so I hope that little metaphor of the baseline helps you understand that there really are four logically distinct ways to benefit people. Prevent harm, remove harm, reduce harm, and confer a pure benefit. Now I'm adding to Ross, I'm, I'm elaborating uh, Ross's prima facie duty of beneficence to try to give you a certain structure, a way to think about this duty. And it's one thing to say we have a duty of beneficence, but when you start to explore it, the different aspects of it, the different ways you can fulfill it, it's a very interesting duty. All right, that's the first of three for today. Let's move on to the second one. Oh, by the way, I, I brought my handout back, and I hope you're looking at yours. Um, I took things a little bit out of order. Um, my, my pattern was to read what Ross says, and then turn the handout over and look at my pithy formulation, and then go into my lecture notes. So let's do that last this time. If you look at Ross's fourth duty number four, he calls it four, but it's really the fifth duty because he has one A and one B. Here's what he says. Some, and he, of course he's talking about, about prima facie duties, some prima facie duties rest on the mere fact that there are other beings in the world whose condition we can make better in respect of virtue, which means good moral character, or of intelligence. And remember what I said, Ross pretty clearly means knowledge or intelligent understanding of the world, or of pleasure. Those are the three things we should do, we should promote. Now the fourth intrinsic good, which is allocating pleasure in proportion to virtue, that's a separate prima facie duty. That's the duty of justice. So that's why he didn't mention it here. It would be, it would be a duplication We've already got a duty, a prima facie duty of justice. We're now talking about a prima facie duty of beneficence. He says, these are the duties of beneficence. So it's his word, not mine. Now turn the handout over or look at the second sheet. Here is what I wrote about it. Duty of, the duty of beneficence, do good. Now I could have said do good for others, but I left that part implicit. Do good. Be a good doer. Okay? As you live your life, be a good doer. Remember, that's not the same as being a do-gooder. 
And if you think I'm kidding, look it up in the dictionary. A do-gooder is not a good thing to be. The term do-gooder has a negative connotation because people who are trying to do good sometimes make things worse or at least fail to make them better. All right? So the term do-gooder connotes some kind of somebody who's bungling and clumsy and makes things worse. So what I, the way I would put it is don't be a do-gooder, be a good doer. And that's what it means to be beneficent. And as I continue there, I wrote, this includes preventing harm, removing harm, reducing harm, and conferring benefit, i.e. improving other people's virtue, intelligence, or knowledge, and pleasure. So that's Ross. That's, those are Ross's words. And now I've given you my gloss or my uh, interpretation of them. Okay, the sixth duty is self-improvement. Notice that this sounds very much like Kant. Kant believed that we have imperfect duties to others and to ourselves. And our imperfect imper duties to ourselves uh, include improving yourself, perfecting yourself, uh, developing your talents, for example. So Ross, who wrote a book on Kant's ethics and who obviously learned from Kant and who obviously agrees with Kant about this, Ross, like Kant, believes that we have moral duties to ourselves, specifically, in this case, duties to improve ourselves. Here's what Ross says about it on the first page of the handout. He calls this duty number six, but it's the seventh one. I'm sorry, he calls it duty, sorry, he calls it duty number five, but it's the sixth duty. He says, some duties rest on the fact that we can improve our own condition in respect of virtue or of intelligence. These are the duties of self-improvement. Once again, he used the word intelligence when he clearly means knowledge or intelligent understanding of the world. Turn the handout over and here's what I wrote. We'll call this the duty, Ross calls this the duty of self-improvement, so we'll use his word, words. And my pithy formulation is perfect yourself. Now I could have said improve yourself, but I like the word, I like the word perfect here because you are, we're all imperfect in many ways. Maybe nobody's perfect, probably nobody's perfect. Uh, no human being at any rate. There's always room for improvement. So as you live your life, over the course of your life, take steps to perfect yourself, which means make yourself more perfect. In other words, move ever closer to a state of perfection. You may never arrive at perfection. In fact, none of us ever will, but you can get closer. And the closer you get, the better, the more you're fulfilling your duty. So become a better person in as many ways as you can. Specifically, cultivate your virtue. And for Ross, that means your character. So do what you can to improve your moral character, right? Try to, try to when you act, try to act from good motives rather than bad. Uh, you may find uh, that you're motivated by self-interest. Try to minimize that and become motivated by genuine concern for others. That would be to improve your moral character. Uh, strive to be honest and forthright and trustworthy in, in your dealings with other people. So become a, a better person morally. That's what Ross means by perfecting your virtue or cultivating your virtue. He also talks about improving your, your intelligence. So Ross thinks that we, each of us, have a duty to become educated. Educate yourself. Learn. Never stop learning. Um, now you may think or hope that when you receive your degree from UTA, your learning will be over. Well, I've got news for you. Learning never stops. You will be learning for the rest of your life. You right now are learning in a formal environment, right? I'm your teacher. I'm teaching you things. And you have other teachers as well. You're in a formal education, a learning environment. But much of the learning that you will do for the rest of your life will be informal. It will be self-learning. You will learn things on your own. And I hope that your college experience gives you a, a desire 
to learn more. So if, if you want to learn more about ethics, go out and purchase Ross's book and sit down and read it on your own after the course is over. In fact, just read it two pages every day. I like to read books that way. I'm reading right now five different books. Every morning, I read a certain number of pages in each of those five books. Why don't I just read one book at a time? Well, I like reading multiple books. I'm reading three books of history and two books of philosophy right now. And as soon as I'm done with one of them, I'll probably replace it with some other book. Um, so pick up a book on some topic. It could be by Kant or Mill or Bentham or Ross, someone who, whom we've discussed in the course, and just read it two pages every day. Just two. Eventually you'll finish it. But the reason to take your time with it is each day when you slowly and carefully read those two pages, it'll give you something to think about for the rest of the day until you read two more pages tomorrow. You kind of let it percolate. Right? Think about what you just read. If you sat and read a 20-page chapter by Ross in one sitting, you're going to be overwhelmed because there's going to be so much in that 20 pages right, that you may not even be able to process it. So I would recommend reading something very slowly, something like Ross. Keep learning throughout your life. That's what Ross is saying. He's not saying it's in your interest to keep learning, although I'm sure he believes that it is. He's saying you have a moral duty. You would be letting yourself down. You would be violating your duty to yourself if you let your talents rust, if you let your mind rot. Keep learning. Never stop. And that could mean things like hobbies. Learn how to garden, right? If you don't know, if you don't have any gardening skills, that's a worthwhile activity. You can not only provide food for yourself from your garden, you can also plant beautiful flowers to increase your aesthetic enjoyment every day. You can share some of your produce with friends or neighbors or colleagues, um, and that's a that's a good thing to do. In fact, that's one way to be beneficent, isn't it? If you learn how to garden and, that, and you cr produce more food than you need or want, you can do good for others by sharing it with them. One of my former colleagues um, is a, a terrific gardener, and I'm not. And he, when we, whenever we meet, uh, we, we meet on a regular basis for lunch at a particular place that we both like. We catch up on the news from each other's lives, and he always brings me some produce from his garden, which my wife and I appreciate. It could be radishes or onions or um, what has he brought us? He brought us um, eggplant, potatoes, and different things to try. And uh, so that's a wonderful thing. He's doing good um, and he's um, cultivating his knowledge. He's learning how to grow different plants and different foods. Okay, so per perfect yourself, mainly by improving your moral character and by learning, lifelong learning. Um, one of the things I always thought with regard to learning is that when you're in college, the main thing you learn is how to learn on your own. I know that sounds funny, but you will be learning on your own once you leave the formal setting of college. You... I hope you've acquired skills in researching and gathering and processing information that will allow you to learn on your own after that. So you learn how to learn when you're in college. You may discover that some of the things you learned in college weren't really true or were incomplete or misleading in a certain way. So you can kind of correct things as you go. You may one day be reading a book by a reliable author and you discover that something you learned in your history course or thought you learned in your history course is incorrect or uh, shallow or incomplete. And that's a nice thing, right? You say, okay, well, maybe my professor was just giving a survey and, and couldn't go into much depth, but I now see the fuller story of the Civil War or whatever you're reading about. Why did Ross leave pleasure out. That's a puzzle, isn't it? Go back to what Ross wrote. When you look at the duty of beneficence, he says that there are three things you need to promote in others. Their virtue, 
their knowledge, which he calls intelligence, and uh, what else? Um, um, pleasure, sorry. Pleasure, virtue, and knowledge. When he comes to self-improvement, all of a sudden we've gotten rid of pleasure. We've got virtue and knowledge. So why did Ross leave pleasure out? Was it a mistake? Was it an, an omission? The answer is no. He explains why he left it out. Not in the quotation I gave you, but in his book. Ross says the reason that there's no duty to promote your own pleasure is because people instinctively promote their own pleasure. They don't need to be nudged or encouraged or prompted to promote their own pleasure. It's part of our nature. Every one of us wants more pleasure. So what would be the point of saying that people have a duty, a moral duty to promote their own pleasure when people are going to do it anyway? It would be overkill. The purpose of saying that people have a duty to do something is to motivate them to do it. And that implies that they don't already have an adequate motivation. But in the case of pleasure for ourselves, we already have an adequate motivation. So there's really no point in saying that people have a moral duty to promote their own pleasure. Pleasure will take care of itself, at least one's own pleasure. But notice, not everybody has an adequate motive to promote the pleasure of others. And that's precisely why Ross says we have a moral duty to promote pleasure in others, because we're not spontaneously motivated in that way. Right? So it was not an omission. When it comes to self-improvement, Ross says the two things we need to do for ourselves is promote our virtue, which is moral care, good moral character, and our knowledge, which he calls intelligent understanding of the world. Okay, I think that's all I have to say about self-improvement. We're down to one more duty, and it's called non-maleficence. If you look at the handout that's been posted for some time entitled Beneficence, you'll see that I also have a discussion of maleficence. Maleficence is the doing of bad or evil or harm. And malevolence, which is a related word, but a different word, malevolence is a motive to do evil. It's a disposition to do evil or inclination to do evil. So malevolent people most of the time do maleficent actions. But occasionally they, they do something beneficent. Remember the assassin in Feldman's book, the, the assassin who was trying to kill a beloved religious leader? That assassin was trying to do something evil, but because he was a bad shot, he ended up doing something good. So he was a malevolent person. He ended up doing a good thing. Malevolent people sometimes perform beneficent acts. And conversely, um, benevolent people, people who are motivated to do good, sometimes end up doing maleficent acts. Do you remember Feldman's example? It was the doctor who went to another country to minister to the sick people. Unbeknownst to her, she carried a disease to them and made their condition much worse. So she was well-intentioned, well-meaning, she meant well, but unfortunately she did harm to them. So back to the point. We're now discussing what Ross calls the duty of non-maleficence. I bet you can figure out what it is. It means not doing harm. You have a duty not to do evil or bad or harm. So let's read what Ross wrote and then look at my pithy formulation. Ross calls this duty number six, but it's the seventh duty. He says, I think that we should distinguish from the duties that may be summed up under the title of not, I'm sorry, let me back up. I think that we should distinguish from four and if you go back and look at four, four is beneficence. So Ross says, I think we should distinguish from the duty of beneficence, the duties that may be summed up under the title of not injuring others or not harming others. 
He then adds the following, no doubt to injure others is incidentally to fail to do them good. And of course that would violate the duty of beneficence. But it seems to me clear that non-maleficence is apprehended as a duty distinct from that of beneficence. And, and this is important, as a duty of a more stringent character. So that's everything Ross says about non-maleficence. Notice what he's saying. Beneficence and non-maleficence are distinct. They're not one duty described in different ways. They're two duties, separate. Beneficence says, do good. Non-maleficence says, don't do bad. One of the duties tells you to do something. The other one tells you not to do something. Beneficence says, thou shalt do good. Non-maleficence says, thou shalt not do bad, or, or injury, or harm, or evil. Now turn the handout over. Here's my pithy formulation. Under the heading of non-maleficence, I wrote, do no harm. Right? Short and sweet. Pithy. And that includes not injuring others. That's one way to refrain from harming others, is to refrain from injuring them, physically injuring them, psych psychologically injuring them, and so on, financially injuring them. So when you look at my pithy formulations, you could, if you were so inclined, teach these to your children. If you, if you believe that Ross is on the right track in his approach to morality, you might teach your children from a very young age. Be faithful. Right? Try to inculcate in your children these moral duties. Be faithful. Rectify your wrongs. Repay kindnesses. Give others their due. Do good. Perfect yourself and do no harm. Now, children of a certain age, very young children, might not know what it means to be faithful. But as your children grow and mature, you can explain these duties in a greater detail. You can explain that being faithful to others includes telling them the truth. Remember Ross said that the duty of veracity is included in the duty of fidelity. And you can explain that to your children, that when you enter into conversation with others, you're implicitly promising to tell the truth. And therefore, it's a, it's a case of fidelity or faithfulness to others. So this would be a, something you could and perhaps should teach your children if you believe that Ross is on the right track on, in, in his moral theory. So back to non-maleficence. The non-maleficence says, do no harm. As you live your life, refrain from harming others. Notice that this would presumably cover animals as well. Right? If, if, there, if you see a snake, for example, when you're out walking in the woods or in a meadow, don't harm the snake. Leave the snake alone. Um, don't gratuitously injure or harm animals because they can feel pain. They can suffer every bit as much as you can. So leave them alone. Take a, take a live and let live attitude toward others, whether human or animal. Um, do whatever you can to avoid injuring others, running into them with your car or stabbing them or punching them. Uh, and so on. In fact, I compiled a list of crimes, all of which would be covered by this moral duty of non-maleficence. Look at all the different interests that a typical human being has. You and I, and every other normal human, hu human being, has an interest in life, an interest in continued life. We have an interest in liberty, or being free to come and go as we please, to move about without interference. We have a duty of, we have a, an interest in security, in being secure in our person and in our homes and in our automobiles. Okay, a duty of security, I'm sorry, an interest in security. We have an interest in property, real property, real estate, or personal property. We have, a, have an interest in bodily integrity. Now this is my body. You can see where it, where it ends and where it begins. Here's where my body begins. And out here is outside of my body. So the body is an enclosed space with boundaries. And the, the boundaries of my body define my bodily integrity. And I have an interest in my bodily integrity. 
And that interest includes not being touched by others against my will or without my consent. I have an interest in not being cut or slashed or stabbed or punched or poisoned. So leave my body alone unless I give you permission to get involved with it or touch it or harm it in any way. I have an interest in reputation, the way I'm my standing in the community, the way I'm thought of by others. And that can be set back or harmed. I have an interest in fidelity or faithfulness. I have relations with others, my wife, for example, and other people can do things that interfere with or harm my duties of fidelity. So someone who committed adultery with my wife would be interfering with me because I have an interest in a certain relation with my wife. Uh, but also treason would fall under this. Um, I have an, Each of us as citizens have an interest in other citizens obeying the law and supporting each other, right? compatriots, members of the same country, citizens of the same country. And when one of us turns against the others, that's a breach of faith. Right? So treason is the perhaps the ultimate uh, act of infidelity. That's why we call it perfidy. Right? It's extreme, it's treachery. So each of these interests is protected by a, by a crime. The criminal law protects us in our interest. How is the interest in life protected? By laws against murder and manslaughter. Murder and manslaughter, which are types of homicide, protect the interest that each of us has in continued life. And if someone takes someone's life, that person will be prosecuted which is a way of, of vindicating the interest that was taken away. Each of us has an interest in liberty. There are laws that prevent kidnapping and false imprisonment. If you kidnap someone, you're depriving that person of his or her liberty. If you, if you falsely imprison somebody by locking someone in, a, in your house or a car, that's a denial or an infringement of someone's liberty. Security is protected by laws against burglary, robbery, and assault. We have a right to be secure in our persons and in our homes. The law against burglary protects the security of the home, which is why originally burglary protected only homes during the nighttime. You want to know the common law definition of burglary? Listen to this. Burglary was defined in the common law as the breaking and entering of the dwelling place of another in the nighttime with the specific intent to commit a felony or petty larceny therein, period. Now, I remember that from many years ago when I studied for the bar exam. I committed all the crimes to memory, to memory and for some reason I haven't forgotten them. But notice, burglary is defined as... the. Uh, a crime that protects the security of the home. And when are people most insecure in their homes? At nighttime. So burglary in the common law could not be committed during the daytime. By definition, it, it has to occur in the nighttime or not at all. And that's because people are the most vulnerable at night. Okay, so burglary, robbery, and assault protect the interest we all have in our uh, security. Property laws, the interest in property is protected by laws against larceny or theft, embezzlement, arson, which is the burning down of a building that someone owns, trespass, and vandalism. So the law protects our interest in property in, in many ways. I just gave you several crimes, larceny, embezzlement, arson, trespass, and vandalism, and there are others as well. How is the interest in bodily integrity protected? Well, there are laws against battery, which means battering somebody, hitting somebody, touching someone. Battery, mayhem, that's a crime. Rape, and forcible sodomy. So there are four criminal laws that are designed to protect the interest everyone has in bodily integrity. How is reputation protected by law? There are laws against defamation. Now, it used to be a crime to defame people. Now, the law leaves it to individuals to file a civil suit if they believe that they've been defamed. What are the two kinds of defamation? Libel and slander. 
and the difference is simple. Libel is written defamation. Slander is oral defamation, where you speak it rather than write it. And how is fidelity, our interest in faithfulness, uh, protected by law? There are laws against adultery, treason, and fraud. So my point in giving you this list is that each of us has many interests. Any one of those interests can be set back by others in the form of criminal conduct. And what Ross is saying is that you, morally speaking, have a duty not to harm others in any of these ways. Okay? There are a lot of ways for human beings to be harmed or to have their interests set back. And the moral duty, the prima facie duty of non-maleficence says, don't set back any of those interests. Okay? Leave people alone. Don't harm them. Now, the last thing that Ross said was very, very interesting. He says, the last clause is a duty of a more stringent character. Now, the word stringent means stronger. We've used that term before. What Ross seems to be saying is that as between beneficence and non-maleficence, the latter is stronger. Non-maleficence is a stronger moral duty than the duty of beneficence. And when you think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, what Ross is saying is that if, if all you can do is either refrain from harming someone or do some good, it's best that you refrain from harming someone. Right? That's more important. Now, maybe there are cases you can imagine where doing good is, it outweighs refraining from harm. Maybe I can come up with, with one. Suppose I'm in a situation where I have to choose between, preve between preventing, uh, I'm sorry, I have to choose between doing some good for someone, which would fulfill my duty of beneficence, and refraining from harming someone. What if the only way for me to do a wonderful, beneficial thing for someone is to step on someone's toe? Now, stepping on someone's toe might cause a momentary pain or discomfort. And so, strictly speaking, that falls under non-maleficence. Right? You ought not to be stepping on people's toes if you can avoid it. What if I knew that by stepping on someone's toe, I could do a great deal of good for someone or for a bunch of people? Arguably, my duty of beneficence outweighs my duty of non-maleficence. Do you, do you agree with that? You should step on that toe and in order to produce this boon for lots of other people. So there's a case where the harm that you commit is very small, just to stepping on a, on a toe, but the amount of good you do is, is great. But we could change the facts to make it come out the other way. What if instead of just stepping on someone's toe, I have to do something that causes someone to lose an arm? Now that's a terrible uh, harm, causing someone to lose an arm permanently. So the person has to live the rest of his or her life with only one arm. Okay, I don't know about you, but I would not want to lose an arm. So suppose you've got a situation where if you cause someone to lose an arm, you can bring about a little bit of happiness for someone. Right? Clearly, in that case, doing a little bit of good for someone is outweighed by the grave harm that you would be doing by causing someone to lose an arm. So when you change the amount of good that's potentially done, and, and when you change the amount of harm that's done, you get different results. And that's part of Ross's plan. He thinks that morality is messy. Morality is complicated. It's not simple like Bentham said. For Bentham, you just, you have a one-track mind. You identify all the people affected by your actions. You quantify how much pain and pleasure each action would cause, you, at the end of it, you add it all up. And the right act is simply the act that produces the greatest balance of happiness over unhappiness. Uh, you could even say that Kant's theory is simplistic in the same way. Right? Kant said you ought, at all times you ought to respect persons. And that's comparatively simple. Ross says morality is not that simple. There are at least seven duties. He thinks there are exactly seven. And in any given situation, you've got to bring all relevant duties to bear 
on that situation. There could be just one duty that applies, and if so, that's the, that would be your duty proper. If two duties apply, one, if one of them points in this direction, and the other one points in another direction, now you've got to assign weight or strength to those two duties in that situation and use your judgment to decide what, the, what your duty proper is because you've got a clash of prima facie duties in that case. Now, could there be three duties that apply in the same situation? Absolutely, there could be. There could be a case where gratitude, beneficence, and justice all apply in the same situation. What would you do? The same thing you did before. You've got to assign weight to each of those three duties and exercise judgment. And you've got to remember that reasonable, intelligent people may disagree about what the right act is. Ross is not troubled by that. Ross can live, Ross says, I can live with that. That's, that's, that's just a function of the messiness of morality. But of course, Ross would not allow you to rig the system, right? You can't say that a particular duty is stronger than some other duty just because you like that outcome. That would not be honest. You've got to be honest with yourself and with others. You've got to conscientiously assign weights uh, to the duties and use your best judgment to determine what your duty proper is and then act accordingly. Obviously, it's not enough to figure out what your duty proper is. The assumption is that you're going to act upon it eventually once you figure it out. So the duty of non-maleficence, Ross seems to be saying, has more weight. It's got a thumb on the scale, if you will. So if you've got the scale, here's the scale. Remember, these are the platters. Um, at, at the outset, it's not as though beneficence and non-maleficence are, are balanced like this. Non-maleficence always has some weight on it to start. Right? That's what he ma means when he says it's a duty of a more stringent character. And it's interesting because there's a slogan uh, with a Latin name that applies here. It's the, the Latin name is primum non nocere. Let me spell it for you. Primum, P-R-I-M-U-M. -M. Right? You can see it's the root of the word primary. It means first, primum. The second word is non, N-O-N. -N, right? And that means no. The third word is nocere. N-O-C-E-R-E, -E. and that means harm. So put it all together. Primum non nocere means first, do no harm. Now, it doesn't mean first in the sense of first and then at some later point in time do something else. What it means is most importantly, first and foremost, refrain from harming. And then, once you've avoided harming anybody, try to do as much good for them as you can. This is a slogan of medicine. Did you know that? Doctors and nurses are taught, first, do no harm. What that means is, suppose you're a doctor. A patient comes to see you with, a, with an ailment, an injury or ailment. The doctor the most important thing for the doctor is don't make the patient worse off than he or she already is. The patient comes in in a certain condition. Don't make it worse. At a minimum, don't make it worse. But do what you can using your knowledge and your skill to improve the condition of the patient. So it seems to me that Ross might well have used that slogan right here. When he says that Non-maleficence is a duty of a more stringent character than beneficence. He's saying, most importantly, do no harm. And then, of course, try to do as much good as you can. And I'm going to leave you with a quotation from um, two logicians. And they're writing about Florence Nightingale, who was one of the early nurses, one of the history's great nurses. Florence Nightingale, they say, transformed modern hospital practice by the motto, whatever hospitals do, they should not spread disease. 
Think about it. A hospital is a setting in which injuries are treated and illnesses treated or, or cured. At a minimum, when people go to a hospital, they shouldn't contract a disease, right? You go to the hospital because something's wrong and you want to get better. Wouldn't it be horrible if you going to the hospital made it worse for you because you came out with a disease that you didn't have when you went in? So, so that expresses this doctrine of primum non nocere, first do no harm. Some of you may have a medical career ahead of you, and I hope you always remember this. Right? Primum non nocere, first do no harm. That means non-maleficence is a weightier duty than beneficence. Okay, I think that's it. Um, so what do I want to say to wrap things up? Since this is the last time I'll be seeing you on video, don't forget the exam on the 11th of May, um, 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 in the evening. I may well send an email to all of you the night before, just a final reminder. Um, I've enjoyed the lecturing. I didn't get to see you. Some of you wrote to me and I wrote back. Um, it's unfortunate we didn't get to you know, see each other in the classroom. You got to see me, um, but I didn't get to see you or talk to you um, orally. Um, but maybe you'll take a course in the fall. Maybe things will be back to normal in the fall. I know I'm going to be teaching logic in the fall, and I'm going to be teaching philosophy of religion. So if that's of interest to you, you may want to sign up. It's an upper-level course, so um, now that you had, you've had ethics, you've had a philosophy course, you should be okay if you take that course. There are no prerequisites, so you could take it if you wanted to. I think it's capped at 30, though, so if you think you might want it, you may want to sign up early so you don't get shut out. All right, enough for the semester. Um, the next thing you hear from me will maybe be an email reminding you of the exam the next day. Other than that, you'll get your grade from the university when it's um, available. So uh, take care, have a great summer, and good luck in your studies from here on out.